Dr. Abby Hafer, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from Massachusetts, USA. You are a biologist, educator, and public speaker teaching human anatomy and physiology at Curry College. You are also the author of The Not-So-Intelligent Designer, a book which looks at the human body with a critical eye and questions just how well put together it actually is. Welcome to the show, Abby. As some of my audience may know, I grew up in Massachusetts and now live in England. You're in Massachusetts right now, but I believe you spent some time here in the UK during your university days. Yes, I actually got a DPhil in zoology from Oxford, and it was a lot of fun doing that. I mean, graduate school life is always stressful. You can ask anybody who's done it. Uh, it's always fraught. Uh, but one thing that was actually really good uh, where I was, was that there were so many opportunities to talk with the great and the good in my field uh, because there were tea rooms and there was coffee time and there were sandwich areas where I ate sandwiches with all kinds of interesting people uh, and there would be pub trips afterwards and this was one thing that I really came to enjoy was just all the different ways that I could interact with people which was very stimulating and I really enjoyed that. Well, today we're going to be exploring the odd and sometimes downright dangerous solutions that evolution has come up with in order to make a human being. But before we begin that dissection, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Abby, did you always have an interest in science and in particular the mechanisms of evolution? Well, I always had an interest in nature. I think that's where many biologists start is actually with an interest in nature. Uh, my father was in the Air Force, so we moved around quite a bit when I was a child and I saw lots of different environments. And we were incredibly lucky in that my mother's family had a camp way out in the middle of nowhere on a lake in Maine, where there is just nature everywhere. Uh, and, you know, it's been shown many times that the way to awaken an interest in nature in children is not to tell them about it, but to put them in it. Um, and I sure did have that. And it was a very, very fortunate thing for me to have. As for evolution, um, I became fascinated at a fairly early age with that. And then in college, when I learned about animal behavior, which was what I actually got my DPhil in, uh, in zoology, I was in the specialty of animal behavior. But what I became really interested in was how all these different fields of biology link up through evolution. So you can see how behavior and ecology interact and physiology, they all interact, but they relate to each other through evolution. Evolution is the thing, as I said, it's how they relate to each other. It's why behavior is related to ecology, for instance. So anyway, this was the part that I just found fascinating. Well, throughout history, the human body has been held up by art, philosophy, and even the early sciences as an example of nature at its best, or even the pinnacle of great design. A mistake people often make about evolution is that the entire process is striving towards the human form or something similar to it. All this and more is covered in your book, The Not-So-Intelligent Designer. Isn't that right? That is absolutely correct. And it's one mistake that scientists and, uh, and philosophers made very early on was assuming that somehow or another evolution was tending towards the human form as being the best possible thing. If you were a God believer, you know, you thought that we were made in God's image and that therefore humans had to be best. Um, but even early evolutionary biologists, there, would, there just was this tendency to think of humans as being the best in all possible ways, and therefore we must have the best bodies. It just kind of stands to reason in that way, if you have that 
frame of mind. Um, but that's not actually how it works. It is certainly not how evolution works. The idea, the whole idea of optimality in evolution is just a bad idea because evolution does not strive for optimality. In fact, evolution does not strive for anything at all. Uh, the best that evolution ever does is that this generation reproduces more, reproduces enough before it dies that the species keeps going. And that's really the only standard that evolution has is so for any given mutation uh, or any given trait, the only standard that it has to reach is good enough to not kill us before reproduction too much of the time. Uh, which is a very low bar compared to any kind of design, much less design by someone capable of creating the universe. And this was actually what got me going in all of this was when I realized this, because in the United States, we have a fairly bad case of uh, pushback to accepting evolution. Uh, it's sad but true. I know it exists elsewhere in the world, but we've got it bad in this country, and it has been impacting science education and in other ways, other parts of our political discourse as well. And um, as an evolutionary biologist, I've always been very frustrated this by this, but I finally came to realize that the problem that scientists had is that this is not a scientific issue, but a political issue. And political arguments are different. And so responding the way that scientists are trained to respond doesn't actually work because political arguments are different. Political arguments need to be short and easy to understand and easy to repeat. And so I kind of racked my brain for what a political style argument for evolution would even look like. Couldn't figure it out. But as you mentioned in your introduction, I teach human anatomy and physiology. And so there was one day late in the year when we were talking about reproductive systems and I had just drawn the male reproductive system up on the board. And, um, so I had drawn the testicles that hang outside of the abdomen, as you know. And uh, I then asked the question if anybody knew why the testes hang outside the body like that, because often somebody does. And sure enough, somebody did know. And the reason is because um, in order to create viable sperm, the testes have to be somewhat cooler than the rest of the body. So I was turning around to write this on the board, and this was where I had my epiphany, my moment of realization. I looked at that and I thought, that's really bad design. Who thought of that? Why would a designer make normal body temperature too hot for sperm production? That's just idiotic. And of course, men are very aware of the problems surrounding having external testes, um, you know, a vulnerable organ in a vulnerable location. All the rest of our organs have some protection. You know, our heads, our soft brains are surrounded by skull. The soft tissues of the heart and lungs are surrounded by the rib cage. And even our, our abdominal organs have protection from the uh, spinal column at the back, and at least some layers of muscle and fat in the front. The testes, on the other hand, are entirely vulnerable, and that's just bad design. And so, as I said, this was when I knew I had my first best argument against intelligent design in the human body, because once I started talking about men's testicles, people would pay attention. It was kind of your first best argument because it's catchy. People would remember it and off we go. And it takes on the anti-evolution argument that's known as intelligent design because evolution, as I said, does not plan, it does not design, and it does not go for optimal solutions. 
So showing the truly bad design uh, is a way into people understanding uh, the whole problem with the anti-evolution movement, especially, and this was one thing that I, I worked very hard at in the book, especially when you can show that there are better quote unquote designs that would have been possible and are exhibited elsewhere in the animal kingdom. So the whole idea that human beings are somehow at the pinnacle of creation can be shown to just not be the case any number of times because there are many cases where we actually got a worse version than other animals got. So clearly we are not God's favorite. I mean, if we're made in God's image, then God has a lot of problems. Um, so I knew when I, when I came on this, that this would be something that would work, that uh, worked for my particular knowledge base as a biologist and as a physiologist. And it would do something useful in that it would provide talking points to people, both non-biologists who really want to support accepting evolution, you know, when they go up above you know, in front of their local school board or something like this, but they're not biologists. They don't the art. They don't know the arguments. And you know, frankly, it shouldn't be everybody's job to become a biologist in order to do this. So I'm giving people talking points that they can use. Um, for that matter, I'm also doing it for my fo fellow biologists because although we often know the arguments or we know the facts. Um, it can be hard to boil it down on the spot into something useful because we are so deeply into our subjects that it can often be hard to talk about. So I made it my mission to come up with political style arguments that people could use in support of accepting evolution and having it taught in schools and the like. So that's what I've been doing. Abby, all of us can relate to the problems that plague the human body. Some are a lot worse than others, of course. But before we get into those, can you remind us of those everyday problems that we may take for granted, but that show that we are far from perfect? Well, there are a bunch of fun things like that. I mean, actually, one thing I am going to bring up is autoimmune diseases. I mean, again, who thought of that? Um, Diabetes, many other diseases are a case of a malfunction of our immune system that is supposed to protect us from invading bacteria and viruses and funguses and the like. But every now and then it gets overexcited and decides to attack our own body parts. Uh, this is how people get type 1 diabetes, for example. Um, that really shouldn't happen in a well-designed system. Um, our eyes, of course, we often require corrective eyewear, including me, as we age. Interesting, because everybody, if they are lucky, gets older. Um, but of course, think about it now. In the natural environment, A, most people didn't get that much older. They only had to survive to reproduce. And as we were evolving, we were not reading. So all of these things show us that, as I said, we were not designed, but rather we have these bodies that we have to make do with. So we need corrective eyewear. We get back problems. The back problem has largely to do with the fact that we walk upright. And so basically we took what should have been a suspension bridge and turned it into a tent pole. Um, and that did give us the use of our hands, uh, which is terrific for us. But on the other hand, the price is lots of back problems. Um, knees in almost any mammal are just bad. Um, if you ever want to see a design where there are, I should say, not a design, but, but a setup where there are just kind of all kinds of little things that it's like, why did you ever do it this way? Because there are sort of corrections upon corrections upon corrections. Um, regarding our eyes, of course, some people do not just 
uh, wind up needing glasses as they get older, but need glasses pretty much from birth. And that has to do with the fact that our eyes are not shaped perfectly. And so as a result, the difference between the lens and the shape of the back of the retina will often create these mismatches so that you wind up needing corrective lenses in order to do the job that your own lens and eyes are not doing. And that just has to do with the fact that, again, we are not perfectly made. Um, and so the actual shape of our the back of our eye and the relationship between and distance between the lens and the back of the eye has not been standardized. So we have a lot of problems there. And one thing that is totally weird is the way that our retinas are put together. The retina is the seeing part of the eye where the cells that receive light, they're called photoreceptors, where the photoreceptors are located because the photoreceptors are actually located at the very base of the retina. And what that means is that all of the sort of plumbing and wiring uh, that goes to the optic nerve is actually in front of those light receiving cells. So light, as it goes through your eye and hits your retina, it has to fight its way past blood vessels that lie on the surface of the retina. It has to fight its way past nerve fibers that lie on the surface of the retina. And it has to fight its way past a whole bunch of other sort of helper ancillary cells before it finally gets to the photoreceptors, which are at the very bottom of all that mess, which means that what our visual systems receive is actually very poor quality information that then requires a lot of image processing by our eyes and by our brains before it actually becomes a useful image. The way I like to put it is, you know, imagine if your cell phone camera had all kinds of junk just in front of the lens and you couldn't get rid of it so that any time that you took a picture there would be all of these things just sitting there between the picture, um, you know, between what your between your camera and what you're trying to photograph so that the image winds up looking like this and you're busy trying to see my face. OK, but, you know, as we do this, you may be able to see bits of it. Right. So do that. Take all of those images and then basically upload them and layer them and do image processing on them. And eventually you'll get something that is sort of like my face, but information has been lost along the way. That's what our retinas are like. So, you know, you and I don't experience that in our everyday lives because the image processing is pretty darn good. But that's the way we're actually put together. Uh, and I can send you a really fun exercise to show this because there is a spot um, on our retina where all of these nerve fibers and blood vessels and so on, where they all come together and then pierce the retina in order to exit the eye through the optic nerve. And that creates one part of our retina that is so clogged with all of this paraphernalia that it cannot see at all. And this area is known as our blind spot or optic disc. And normally, because we have two eyes and the visual fields overlap, we wind up not really being aware that the blind spot is there. But we have exercises we can do that the audience can print out at home to find their blind spot. And it's really weird. It's a little piece of paper that has like an X and an O on them at a certain distance. And you just look at them and you move the paper forward and eventually one of those marks just disappears. You stop seeing it. Um, and that is when you have find, found the blind spot. Um, in your visual field or in one of your eyes. So it's really quite remarkable. And we're stuck with it. And meanwhile, other animals did not get that system. There are other animals that have retinas that were designed, we'll use the term here, meaning 
Through the sheer luck of evolution, they wound up with a different system where the photoreceptors are in front of all of the nerve fibers and blood vessels and the like. So they actually got a much better system, which again gets back to the whole business of we are not the pinnacle of creation. If we are God's favorite, I would like to know why God gave squid better eyes. Because animals like squid and octopuses have these retinas that are actually well, frankly, built with the physics of optics in mind, but of course they were not built and nothing was in mind. They just got lucky. Um, but as I said, you know, if you really believe in a designer, then you have to ask the question of who does God like better, us or squid? Um, and this can lead to some interesting discussions. Well, some of these imperfections are more than just inconveniences. They can be dangerous, debilitating, and even fatal, correct? Oh yeah, there are a number of features of the human body uh, that are fatal and they it's not even a major malfunction, it's just the way we are put together. The one that's easiest to understand that I think we've all experienced at one point or another is the choking hazard uh, because basically our windpipe and our food passage, the windpipe is known as the trachea and the food passage is known as the esophagus. These are the two tubes in our throat. But just above that area is an area known as the pharynx, which is a common tube for air and liquid and food. And when we inhale, basically the air is vacuumed into our lungs. Uh, but if you are eating and you happen to inhale when you have food in your mouth, then that food can be inhaled into your windpipe where it will block breathing. And this happens pretty frequently. This is not an unknown cause of death in many people. Um, so you can simply wind, but it's because we have our air passages and our food passages meeting and mixing um, in the pharynx and for that matter in the mouth as well. And so, as I said, people can be happily having a restaurant meal and talking to their friends. And as I said, they can then just suddenly inhale because they're in the middle of a good story and they want to keep talking. Next thing you know, they're actually dying of asphyxiation because a piece of meat has gotten stuck in their trachea and at that point if they don't get rid of the blockage very quickly then they can just die of suffocation and many otherwise perfectly healthy people can die that way this is also why people can die from choking on their vomit not a nice subject but physiology is rarely pleasant um, so these are, these are all things that can happen because our air passages and our food passages meet and mix. And we didn't have to get that system. Whales, for instance, and dolphins have respiratory systems and digestive systems where the tubes are completely separate. So whales can't die from choking on their food, but we can't. So, uh, you know, again, you kind of have to ask who God likes better. Um, we also have an appendix and the appendix is this odd portion of our digestive system that is so odd it does not actually digest anything. It does have some tissue from our immune system in it, but there's lots of other immune tissue in our digestive system, so we don't actually need it. And every now and then a colony of really obnoxious bacteria gets going in the human appendix because bacteria will tend to breed up where there is a lack of flow. This is why if you're looking for bacteria uh, along a stream, you are more likely to find it at the sides than in the center of the stream where the, uh, where the water is flowing fast. Where there is a lack of, food, of, of flow, you will tend to find bacterial colonies. And that portion of our digestive system 
is in a blind sac called the cecum, and then the appendix is a very narrow blind tube off of this blind sac. So there's basically no flow. Perfect place for a bacterial colony to breed, and every now and then, if things go badly, then you wind up with a colony of bacteria breeding in the appendix. Um, and often there's some kind of a small blockage that builds up, not surprisingly, where there is no flow. And you wind up with an appendix there where, where you then have such a successful bacterial colony uh, that they breed up beyond the confines of the appendix and it bursts. And at that point, bacteria are introduced into your abdomen and you die. Um, and it used to be that people would die regularly from infected appendixes or from burst appendixes, I should say. Um, <clears throat> and so until we invented decent surgical techniques, perfectly healthy people would die from, from a burst appendix. And this very often happened to young people. So as I said, not a good design. Meanwhile, the cecum and the appendix and those bacterial colonies are very useful in animals that digest wood. And in that case, these are so well developed that they are large. They are not likely to get clogged uh, because they're much bigger and longer. And animals that digest wood very often have these really long and elaborate cecums, uh, but that is so that the bacterial colony there can break down the wood. And very often, in fact, what those animals do is that they do not so much eat the wood as they let the bacteria chow down on it, and then they basically digest the, the bacteria. So they get benefit from the energy they ingested through this indirect means. This is not at all unusual. It works really well in animals that digest wood, but humans don't digest wood. So we have the organs for it, but they don't work, and they occasionally kill us. Um, so, you know, again, a really lousy design, uh, but we're stuck with it because, frankly, we're related to other animals. Um, and another really nice example of this is our inability to make vitamin C. Did you know that many, many, many animals can actually manufacture vitamin C in their own bodies? This is why many animals don't die of scurvy, even if they have all meat diets. We, on the other hand, famously can die of scurvy, which is a vitamin C deficiency if we don't get fresh produce, if we do not get vegetables and fruits on a regular basis. Um, we can die of scurvy, but as I said, many, many other animals can't because they have a full and complete biochemical pathway in their bodies for making vitamin C we do not. And absolutely criminally, we have most of the pathway. But there's just one step at the very end that does not work in humans. And again, this is evidence that we are related to other animals. But man, we got the bad mutation in that case. It didn't affect our primate ancestors because they ate fruits and vegetables anyway. Uh, but as humans spread out and got into more northerly areas or more southerly areas where you wouldn't necessarily get fresh produce during the winter time, or famously, you know, for sailing trips, if you were eating no, if the, before the days of refrigeration, there was no ability to keep fresh produce. And so when we started venturing into territories like that, then scurvy started showing up. As I said, it didn't really bother our earlier primate ancestors because they always ate fresh fruit anyway, but because human beings got ambitious and started spreading into other environments, it started showing up. And this is why Native Americans, for instance, uh, brewed tea from various evergreens, including famously the Aneda tree, 
Uh, and basically, you could make a tea out of that that had vitamin C in it. And this is how the Native Americans would survive North American winters. But as I said, we have to, we had to invent these things because our bodies are so imperfect. Well, one of the most important aspects of any living thing is its ability and drive to reproduce. For animals, reproduction and everything connected to it seems to be no problem at all. But for human beings, well, that's a different story. Well, actually, many animals do have problems with reproducing as well. And I'll give just one example. As I said, we, we may think that nature is all kind and sweet, but actually all animals are evolved. And so we all have our problems. One infamously horrible problem is for hyenas, um, where they have a birth canal that is one inch in diameter, um, which is really just too small for their cubs. So they actually have about a 60% cub mortality and about an 18% mortality rate for first time mothers as well. So so other animals don't necessarily have it easy, but neither do we. And you'd think if we had been designed that we might have got something better than what we got. So we have all kinds of problems with our reproductive systems. Uh, in the male reproductive system, sort of buried deep inside, um, there is a gland called the prostate. and the urinary tract famously runs right through the prostate, which means that as the prostate enlarges as men get older, which is just what routinely happens, um, it slowly can start blocking the urinary stream. And this is just a problem that older men often have. And it's just because, I mean, who thought of putting the urinary tube straight through a gland that enlarges as we age. It, you know, that is not good design. And likewise, just in terms of general purpose design, there's the whole business of how many eggs and sperm are wasted. Sperm are made fresh every day or two, and the old sperm are just basically reabsorbed back into the system. Um, and so there's Basically, they, they get recycled for parts. Uh, eggs, on the other hand, um, a female is born with all of the eggs she will ever have. They are in her ovaries and they're sort of stored away. And so your average human female will have about 500 eggs in her ovaries. And even in the course of a long reproductive life, she will use nowhere near 500 eggs. So they're kind of sitting there waiting and, and most of them will in the end be wasted. Um, so as I said, those are kind of, you know, minor design flaws. Uh, but then when we get into actual reproduction, the problems go way, way up. And one thing that is tragic for people who think that we are well designed, and I think this is one place where the whole idea of the human body being so perfect can lead to some really, uh, to lead to some real suffering, uh, is that when it comes to gestation, uh, people need to know that about 25% of all fertilized human eggs fail to implant on the uterine lining. This is a really crucial step where the fertilized egg has been traveling from the uterine tube down to the uterus, and it then actually has to implant on the lining of the uterus if the embryo is going to continue to develop. If it fails to implant, um, then basically it's doomed and it will then eventually, you know, cease to exist as, um, you know, as a fertilized egg because it will be washed out of the female reproductive tract along with menstrual fluid. So as I said, about 25% of all fertilized eggs fail to implant. And then when it comes to failures of gestation altogether, about 31% of all pregnancies 
result in miscarriage, result in a, a do not result in a, in a live birth. I will put it that way. And so that's a large failure rate. And people can be made to feel very guilty about this, that everything should just work perfectly and they must have done something wrong. And this can be used to tell women that God is punishing them for some reason. And it's none of that. It's that we have an evolved system and it does not work well and it's not good, but it's what we're stuck with. And this can help women a lot, I think, with, with feeling guilty. And there's also just the whole problem with gestation. If you've ever looked at human development, there are so many ways in which it can go wrong so that humans can wind up with all kinds of birth defects. And again, this is just an imperfection in our human systems. And if we believe that God is punishing us, then, you know, we can feel all kinds of unnecessary guilt. And I know one woman who read my book actually said that it was very useful for her to read this and realize that she simply had an imperfect reproductive system and it freed her mind to get her children the help they needed to be able to grow up into, you know, capable and fulfilled live human beings. And so the whole idea of we're not perfect, so we got to do the best we can with what we've got is actually a really powerful message. So as I said, you know, there are problems with implantation, there are problems with continuing gestation even after implantation, and there are the problems of development not coming off the way we, quote, think it should, unquote. Uh, and then there's the whole problem of getting that baby outside of the mother's body at all, even if, as I said, everything else goes well, there's still that problem of live birth. And in the days before modern medicine, many women did die in childbirth. It's one of the reasons why so many people today go for cesarean sections. Giving birth is dangerous. In colonial America, it was not unusual for a woman to write her will before going into labor because she knew she might not survive it. And of course, very often babies didn't survive the process either. And it gets back to that whole business of being bipeds again, because we walk, we walk upright while being very smart. And those two things have competing requirement. Walking upright requires narrow hips because if the hips are too wide, it's actually very difficult to walk or run. So any woman in the natural environment who couldn't walk or run would die. So hips must be narrow enough for walking and running. On the other hand, we are very smart. And being very smart requires large brains. Large brains require large heads. Large heads require wide hips for a wide birth canal. And the result is an uneasy compromise that doesn't work very well and is very hard on some people. And that's the hallmark of evolution, uneasy compromises. Remember, it's not that we all have to survive to have perfect babies. It's that enough of us have to survive to reproduce most of the time. And so as a result, nature does not care that some women and some babies die so long as the overall birth rate is high enough to keep the species going. So it's cruel. It's what we're stuck with. So, as I said, the birth canal is too narrow. This results in pain. This results in death of the mother. It results in death of uh, the infant that's uh, on its way out. And it didn't have to be that way. If we had been designed, we could have gotten a system like kangaroos. Kangaroos are also bipeds. 
But what they do is they give birth to very small embryo-like young, which then finish their development in a pouch on the outside of the mother's body. That pouch comes complete with a nipple for nursing. That is where the embryos continue their development. So the whole business of essentially having to break the woman's pelvis in order to produce a live birth does not happen in kangaroos. So again, you have to ask yourself, who does God like better, us or kangaroos? And again, it's just kind of a way of illustrating that we are not designed, we are certainly not optimally designed, and that things could have been done better. And we see better examples in other animals, but because it's evolution, we didn't get that stuff because evolution, of course, is not planned. Your book, The Not So Intelligent Designer, really is an eye opener. I just want to thank you for taking the time to come onto the show today to talk about these all too often ignored facts. So, what's next for you, Abby? Um, are there any lectures coming up or perhaps another book in the works? Well, I'm often giving talks both by Zoom and in person. I have one coming up uh, for a time not yet determined with the Houston Oasis, but um, it's not unusual for me to appear at conferences and also to give talks to smaller groups. Um, I can be found on Facebook, but as I said, I'm often giving lectures and I always post where I will be talking um, on my Facebook page. I write for Only Sky, where I wrote a whole lot um, about uh, the physiological aspects of abortion, which I think have been largely ignored. Uh, and I also write for a law journal called Lawyers Daily. Um, my bailiwick in all the things that I do is kind of the confluence between science and politics and public policy. So if there are policy or political questions that impinge on science in some way, that's where you will find me. Um, right now I'm working on a book on the price of science denial, probably to be called Denied to Death. And it's basically, as I said, looking at the human price of science denial. So I start by talking about an infamous problem with the American space program called the Challenger disaster, which was where the space shuttle Challenger blew up, or rather disintegrated, I should say, not long after launch because engineers' warnings had been ignored about how the temperatures were so low that these rubber plastic gaskets known as O-rings were not going to fully seal off uh, fuel tanks from flames. And as I said, the engineers knew it was going to explode and they felt horribly guilty about it. And uh, But as I said, sort of political will prevailed and the result was that it killed an entire crew of American astronauts on live TV. Um, but unfortunately we did not heed the warnings of that problem and I will then be going through many, many different aspects in which um, in the United States in particular, we are having problems with science denial, including science education, um, both in public schools, as you may have heard recently in places like Florida, uh, but also uh, very much so in private education, there are Christian schools that are basically not held to any science standards at all, and what they uh, what they teach is actual lies to impressionable young people. So this is known um, this is known as accelerated Christian education, and it's not education at all, at least not in the sciences. So you know the kids are taught that evolution didn't take place because the Loch Ness monster is real, and that proves that dinosaurs are still among us. You're getting the idea, okay? So as I said, lousy stuff, and this is what a lot, of, and 
these are also children who are educated with the idea that Christians must really take over politics and run for office so that we can then have a country that is written, that is uh, run rather uh, according to biblical principles and of course by them because they know best. Um, but I then, the bookend on the other end, or I should say the bookends on the other end are COVID-19 where there was clear science showing what needed to be done. And before vaccines, it was clear what we needed to do. We learned very fast as we went along, or I should say scientists learned very fast as we went along. But we had one million Americans so far die of, of COVID-19. We still have people dying of it uh, amongst people who have not been vaccinated, who have refused to be vaccinated. Uh, but we had many, many hundreds of thousands of what are called unnecessary deaths. I mean, anytime that there is a pandemic, there are going to be people who die because we just don't get a handle on it quickly enough. That happened right here in Boston, in fact, where there was a conference that took place not long before COVID-19 was detected, and it was a major spreading event. It was before we knew it was happening. So, you know, there were people who died from that because we literally did not know better. But once we did find out better, there were lots of things that the United States could have done and didn't do that the U.S. government could have done but did not do. Um, and as I said, hundreds of thousands of Americans died as a result of science denial. And of course, these days, uh, if we continue denying the science of climate change, uh, that's going to be a problem for all of humanity. I do think we're getting wiser on that. I do think, I hope, but I also think that a corner has been turned in terms of acceptance of the idea of climate change, but then that of course needs to be followed up with action on climate change, which is gonna be hard. You know, there's no way around the fact that it is going to be hard, but it is also necessary. And we've done hard things before. Um, so that's what the book is about. As I said, I often write in Only Sky. I often write in Lawyers Daily. Um, and so those are always fun things to look in on. If you just Google Abby Hafer, you will very often find all kinds of fun things that I'm doing and links to other talks. I've written a couple of books. I've written The Not-So-Intelligent Designer. I've also written or co-written, I should say, a book called Darwin's Apostles, uh, which was a fun project about the scientists in Darwin's time who clubbed together to get uh, evolution accepted both in the scientific community and in the public at large. And the way I put it is that they succeeded with three quarters of what they set out to do. They wanted evolution accepted by the scientific communities in England slash Europe and the United States. And they wanted evolution accepted by the general public in England and Europe and also the United States. And they really only failed in, in getting the entire U.S. population to accept evolution. And you know, the U.S. is a big country, so I think they did a pretty good job. But as I said, it does also go to show a little bit about what I was talking about with making political style arguments. They all had their own strengths and weaknesses. And for instance, Huxley was fairly famous as a showman for coming up with ways of communicating the truth of evolution in public lectures that could get pretty colorful at times because he understood that that's how you do it. So as I said, that's a book called Darwin's Apostles. I've written in a bunch of other books, a lot of the stuff about birth can be found in a book called Women v. Religion, which to which I contributed a chapter. 
I contributed a long chapter on human sexuality to the Oxford Handbook in Humanism. There you can go and find out all the different ways in which the gender binary uh, that people get so exercised about these days is not a thing in the animal kingdom. And let's not even get into plants. So as I said, you can look there for lots of fun things about the gender binary, about which I give talks as well. Um, and I have written chapters in two of John Loftus's books, uh, one on evolution in his book, The Case Against Miracles. And I also contributed a chapter to his book called Christianity in the Light of Science. So there are lots of fun things for you to read. If you want to find out more about my talk about the gender binary, you can look up the talk, which is online, called Everything You Know About Sex is Wrong, Part 1, The Gender Binary. I figured it was too large a topic to manage with only one lecture because there's so many misconceptions about sex and sexuality. So the first one is about the gender binary. So there are lots of fun things for you to look up and play with. And I hope you enjoy them. I will leave links to your books and social media in the description below. And hopefully we can have you back on the show in the very near future. Thanks very much for having me on. This has been a whole lot of fun. I hope people learned a few things, but most I hope people enjoyed hearing the talk and enjoy finding out more about all of these fascinating topics. Mm -hmm.